So where we finished off on uh, Monday, I've gone through this set of, of uh, tools and concepts from effective field theory that are useful for thinking about beyond the standard model physics. And we finished up by, by studying the pions where we saw that the um, charged pions have a coupling to electromagnetism that breaks any possible shift symmetry on those charged pions, and whereas the neutral pion does not. And then this leads us, even if we don't know what the UV completion is, this leads us to, to, to expect that there could be corrections to the charge pion mass um, <clears throat> proportional to this parameter, which is just the, the QED gauge coupling, uh, um, which uh, do not enter for the, for the neutral pion. So we expect some sort of mass splitting. If we do a dumb estimate, um, naive estimate, it shows that something should show up around the energies of 750 MeV or so. Um, if you want to explain the, the charge neutral pion mass splitting um, from these corrections, unknown corrections from the UV physics. And indeed, that's precisely what happens. And in the full UV story, where you have the rho mesons and so on, you can actually just go ahead and calculate this mass splitting. And that naive uh, sort of guesstimate um, works out very well. When we then go to the Higgs, we, we can imagine that the Higgs is a scalar, perhaps like a, a, a pion or something like that. And there's some UV story that tells us why it has the mass scale that it does. It tells it that this UV story will tell us where the weak scale comes from. In analogy to the pions, where the pions are some light scalars, of course, if we just discovered the light, the, the pions, we could have just said, oh, well, job done, we've discovered some particles and we leave it there, but as scientists, that's not what we do. We ask, you know, ask where are these mass parameters coming from? Where does the scale come from? How can we understand its interactions? How can we understand the, the structures and symmetries um, involved in pion physics? And we want to do exactly the same thing with the Higgs. We don't know where this particle comes from. We don't know where the, the weak scale comes from. So we want to apply the same sort of approach in order to understand what the, U, the full UV story that explains uh, where the Higgs sector comes from, um, we, we, we want to understand uh, what structures it may take. And we can, can undertake exactly the same sort of exercise. So we stare at the, the, the action for the Higgs. And already you see a number of things that, that, that go wrong. So just like the pions, um, if we, we want to imagine that the, the Higgs is maybe lighter than, than the U, scale of the UV completion, and we know that that's pretty much, uh, that that is true from the LHC results essentially, so we want to imagine that the Higgs is, is lighter than, than the UV completion. So maybe there's some sort of approximate shift symmetry just like the pions had. But then we can do exactly the same thing. And we notice that we have parameters in the action that are telling us that this shift symmetry is broken. We have the two gauge couplings. Uh, we have the quartic interaction. And we have the Yukawa couplings with fermions. So we can estimate, that again, now this does not mean that we're literally drawing loops of gauge bosons or loops of Higgs bosons or loops of top quarks or something like that. But just the fact that these parameters exist and they break the shift symmetry can lead us to estimate that there should be, we would expect in a typical UV completion to have corrections to the Higgs mass squared, which are proportional to things like uh, the gauge coupling squared, um, the quartic, or the, let's, let's say, let's call this Y actually. Uh, the Yukawa coupling squared multiplied by the, the cutoff squared over something like 16 pi squared. This is exactly what we did for the pions, and we see that this uh, naive guesstimate works very well. Um, but then if we do this, we see that, that really, especially when we look at the top Yukawa coupling, that if these corrections to the Higgs mass are not going to be larger than the actual measured value of the Higgs mass itself, this tells you that lambda should be sitting really around a, just around the corner similarly to, to what happened with the pions. It's telling us that lambda should probably kick in by around, there should be num some new physics if things are fully in analogy to the pions, kicking in around 500 GeV. And again, this is not, you know, this is not some magic or hocus pocus. We're doing exactly the same thing for the Higgs that we did for the, for the pions. Um, but the LHC has run, and uh, as yet, we have not uh, seen anything. If the new particles of the UV completion were colored, if they were charged under QCD, then for sure we would have expected them to see them um, if they had mass in the ballpark of 500 GeV, unless they were doing something particularly clever and elusive to hide. That is possible. You can hide QCD uh, charged particles with that mass scale at the LHC, but it's not easy. 
Um, or it could mean that whatever particles uh, live in this UV theory maybe uh, don't have much to do with QCD. Maybe they're just electroweak charged or they're gauge neutral or something like that. We will come to an example like that at the end of this lecture. Um, in which case, they could still very well be hiding at around this mass scale. But nonetheless, this is a big puzzle. And um, it's a puzzle that was anticipated long before LHC running, of course. Um, because if we take the, you know, the cutoff to be, say, the Planck scale, if we imagine that, that that's around the ballpark of the Planck scale, then, uh, then uh, these corrections would have been enormous. So people have been thinking about the hierarchy problem for a long time. But really, what the LHC has done is make this, is really focus the hierarchy problem and make it much more acute. And various people have, have reacted in various ways uh, to this, from all the way from you know, investing all of their time to working on the hierarchy problem and finding new ways to understand this puzzle, um, on one end of the spectrum all the way to just totally burying, burying their heads, heads in the sand and, uh, and thinking about something else. Um, but as you saw, this is sort of hand wavy. This is a rough estimate. Um, and it shows that the hierarchy problem is not something that, it is something that you can calculate in a given theory, in a given UV completion that tells you where the weak scale comes from, that really predicts the value of the weak scale. You can calculate it and you can make all of these, uh, all of these things very quantitative with the, the correct coefficients out the front here and everything like that. But while we don't know what the UV completion is, it's sort of, um, it's more uh, qualitative than, 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 uh, than strictly quantitative. But you can see it's a, it's a form of, uh, of a strategy. This is perhaps a, a hint, um, gives us a hint about what possible UV completions uh, could look like. And this is why it's, it's, it's worth paying a lot of attention to. It may be the one piece of evidence that we have about the next layer, the structure of the next layer of physics, just like with the pions, we could tell a little bit about what the UV completion would look like even if we hadn't measured it. Um, and here, this may be the hint, a hint as to what is going on. So it's worth taking seriously. So the rest of this lecture, not this afternoon's, but this lecture I want to talk about it. I'm going to talk about, my plan is to talk about approaches to the hierarchy problem that are not necessarily textbook material. Um, if you want, on Friday we can do things like extra dimensions and supersymmetry. Uh, in fact, I'll let you decide what, what you prefer. We'll have a vote. Um, uh, but what I want to try and give you a taste of is sort of more up-to-date material, theories that are maybe not even widely, completely widely ex accepted um, or are, are just at the, the start of being developed um, to give you a sense or a notion of, of uh, the sort of ideas that people are exploring now. Again, my, my, my logic for doing this is that I think it's much more important that you see the various tools that are being used and, and how the ideas that, that, are, that are coming out these days rather than a, a detailed lecture course on one specific uh, approach. Before that, though, I want to discuss three or four um, strategies for understanding what's going on and um, uh, in, a, in, a ver in very little detail at all, um, just to give you a sense of, of some things you may, may have heard of or uh, some of the really more um, exotic possibilities that, that, uh, that could be going on. So one approach that you've probably heard of, I think, um, is known as scale invariance. Um, so, so how do people invoke scale invariance? So you will note in the standard model, if I just write down the standard model living on its own, this, the, the second or, th or no, the fourth option we discussed yesterday when looking at those different possibilities for the mass parameters is if that all of the dimensionful parameters are zero, you have a scale invariant theory. So you'll note that in the standard model, um, if we just write it down on its own, the only parameter that breaks scale invariance is the, the mass parameter here. It's like the spurion for breaking scale invariance. So if there's no other parameter in the theory that breaks scale invariance, then, then this is, it's perfectly natural for this guy to be small because it doesn't get any large quantum corrections from anywhere else. Um, it will just stay, stay where it is. So you could argue that within the standard model, um, there's, no, there's, no, uh, problem, there's no hierarchy problem whatsoever because uh, the theory uh, has an approximate scale invariant 
uh, scale invariance. And I would tend to agree with that within the standard model alone, that, that, is, uh, that is essentially the case. Of course, it's not fully scale invariant when you RG evolve, the, the, the gauge couplings run and so on, but at least that occurs in a relatively uh, uh, controlled manner. The, the hypercharge gauge coupling at very, very high energies becomes very large and non-perturbative. So even within the standard model, there is, um, there is actually a breaking of uh, scale invariance in the UV. But, um, but I'm happy to, to, to sweep that under the carpet for a moment and just talk about the standard model. But the problem you see with the hierarchy problem isn't, isn't the standard model. As I said uh, yesterday, there are many ways that you can naturally have a light scalar within a given uh, quantum field theory. The problem is that we don't believe that the, the cutoff of the theory is scale invariant. And a way to, uh, that, that the UV uh, completion is scale invariant. And a reason to see this is, again, to keep going back to this pion analogy. I could have said exactly the same thing about the charged pions. Remember yesterday, we saw that the charged pion is coupled to the photon, the neutral pion is not. And I could have said, taken exactly the same argument and said, well, look, when I look at the pion action, there's the, the kinetic terms and the gauge couplings they all respect scale invariance, so there should be zero mass corrections to the charged pions and the neutral pions. Um, so, so who cares? They should still have the same mass to leading order. Of course, that would have been completely wrong, and you would have actually got the physics entirely wrong because the breaking of the scale invariance um, um, lives entirely in the UV. The UV theory itself breaks scale invariance, and that's what leads to a mass correction to the, to the charged pion relative to the neutral pion. So it doesn't work for pions. And I'm not totally convinced. Of course, it's a very, very interesting avenue to, to consider. Um, but I'm not totally convinced that it can work in the most simple setups. And really, what if you want to, to flesh, flesh this out as, a, as an approach to the hierarchy problem, you, what you really need to do is fully demonstrate that you can uh, have, have a, a scale invariance all the way up to infinity, all the way to the, to the far UV. Yep. Yes. Pardon? This one here? Uh, no. Sorry, I can't hear you. You need to. I, you need to speak up. I can't hear you. So it will uh, it, when it RG evolves. It will, there'll be uh, one loop RG evolution which breaks scale invariance. Um, just do a simple exercise. So there's the scale invariance, the symmetry that I wrote down yesterday, where you rescale the fields and the, the derivatives and uh, spatial coordinates. You can do the same thing here. I can't, you really need to speak up, I can't hear you. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, in, in different dimensions, lambda, dimensions other than four, lambda carries a mass dimension, so it does break scale invariance, but not in 4D. Um, okay, uh, super, so, so, so yes, yeah, so the hard work, the really interesting work, which some people have, have been trying to do, and I think it's super interesting, is to really demonstrate that you can um, embed the standard model within gravity in such a way that the theory crosses no new, uh, no new mass thresholds. There's essentially no UV scale. It flows all the way to some sort of conformal field theory um, in the UV. And it's not impossible, but, uh, but um, it looks difficult. Another approach, um, which I think is extremely interesting, um, but I've not seen any explicit example that really works, um, is, to, is that the, 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 this expectation really f relies heavily on um, the standard effective field theory picture for how, um, uh, how uh, uh, the effects of, of UV scales can come in and, and, and can, can feed into the infrared theory. And this is known, this sort of the basic, this basic picture of, of um, effective field theories in, in quantum field theory is known as sort of uh, the Wilsonian picture. And it is based, you know, the way, the way I've presented it, because obviously I don't have time to go into the details, is it, the, what it's based on is um, some very simple notions of quantum field theory um, that hark back to the early days of the operator product expansion and things like this. Um, 
where you're working with a Lorentz invariant unitar unitary, unitary uh, causal uh, quantum field theory. But one interesting thing is that uh, perhaps Q of T itself is starting to break um, uh, at the weak scale or above. I don't know how that would be, but if you can screw around with, with these notions of, of unitarity or perhaps causality, they're all tied together, or maybe locality, I'm not sure, then, um, then you could hope to actually break uh, uh, this picture of the hierarchy problem in such a way that you could have a, what appears to be a separation of scales without um, any extra symmetries, um, but nonetheless where these sorts of things will cancel. And there's an example where, where you can see that this can happen, um, that has been studied. It's not, uh, I don't really think it's a really, it's not a working example, but it's an interesting uh, 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 approach. And this is known as the Lee-Wick type of theories. And in these Lee-Wick type of theories, essentially um, it, uh, in the UV, as far as we can understand there being a UV, because when you, when you see what I'm about to, to say, it's very hard to even understand what you mean by scales when you get to this theory. So let's say at short distances. Um, what enters along with the normal particles are particles that have a propagator. So the normal particles would have the normal propagator, something like this. But then there are additional particles that show up at a mass scale big M who have a propagator that looks like this. And they have the same couplings as all the standard models and standard model particles and so on. And you see that when P squared um, uh, becomes large, these two propagators actually start to cancel. But what's happened here is that you see the kinetic term, the residue of the pole uh, for this propagator is negative, which means that you actually have a ghost in your theory, which means you have negative norm states. So you have states with, uh, uh, you're now working in a, in a Hilbert space, which um, is not, does not have uh, totally positive norm states, uh, insofar as you could define one, uh, a Hilbert space like that. Um, so this is an approach to the hierarchy problem where it's been demonstrated that if you have these sort of ghost particles around, then the, this cancellation means that you don't get the, 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 the usual story of the, the heavy scale feeding into the, to the, IR, uh, the IR scalar mass. Nonetheless, there are enormous problems with ghosts. For example, your vacuum is unstable. You can just uh, arbitrarily decay to lower energy, vacu lower energy vacu energy from our perspective by uh, producing these, these ghost particles. But I think it's very, very interesting. And maybe, um, uh, maybe this is a sort of approach um, like with uh, people who sometimes label this sort of general approach as, as uh, uh, things like UV IR mixing, where because of messing around with the usual tenets of quantum mechanics, the, the physics at high scales at small distances actually mixes with physics at, at low scales, again, screwing up that scale separation of effective field theories. So it's very interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, another one is anthropics. which is also a very, very interesting approach. And the idea for anthropics is imagine um, that there are many different vacua out there where the standard model parameters take different values. So there's some sort of, we call it a landscape, where, where um, say, at this point in the vacuum, some scalar field that sets the background value of, say, a gauge coupling or the Higgs mass or whatever, takes one value, but in a different vacuum over here, takes a different value. And we're in one of these vacua, uh, which thanks to inflation has grown very, very big. So all of these other vacua exist. And as far as, you know, they exist in, in, in a sort of academic sense. They don't exist in the sense of being able to travel over there or measure them or, or study them in any way. They're outside our, our horizon and they'll always be outside our horizon. Nonetheless, these different vacua exist. They have different values of parameters. And um, then we would only find ourselves in a vacuum in which the parameters took the sorts of values that w could lead to life. We would only find ourselves as life in a vacuum that can, uh, that can, um, uh, that can host life. This isn't an empty argument. It's a very uh, powerful concept, I think. Uh, some people sort of uh, have a, a visceral reaction to it. I don't. Um, it's a perfectly plausible thing in my mind. But what it requires, if you wanted to use this to explain a small value of the weak scale, it requires that our that the formation of life needs the weak scale to be very small, to be near where it is. Or another, uh, another, way of, uh, another aspect of it is that it requires that even if all of the different parameters can take different values, 
that nonetheless the weak scale would want to be very small. And there are, there are papers that sort of try to attack this problem, none of them super, you know, super convincing, in my opinion. Um, but this may be if someone could find that there's some you know, really core uh, 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 property of nature that requires the weak scale to be small, that then um, this could potentially explain not why the weak scale is small, but why we're in a, happen to be in a universe where the weak, why the, where the weak scale is small. And the last one, which I think is by far the most um, uh, radical, is to, to essentially break calculability. By, by, by this, I, I mean something very, very definite. So the, the whole notion, you know, the, the whole uh, reason we're puzzled about the hierarchy problem is that um, just like the pions, we believe that this is an effective field theory and we're measuring its parameters and that the values of those parameters will have an explanation in, the UV, in some UV theory that we will be able to derive the value of the, the Higgs mass and the weak scale from the parameters of a UV theory. Again, this is not an exotic notion. This is precisely what happens with pions. We could have, uh, we could have with pions, we could have measured them and said, okay, done. I've got some scalars. They've got some masses. I'm going to set the masses just by my experimental measurements, choose my counter term to be thus, and forget about it and not ask any more questions or build any more experiments. We could have done that. But of course, that, that would have been a, a, a very cowardly and lazy approach because it would have been saying, well, let's just stop asking questions about nature and, and uh, wash our hands of it. The reality is that the pion masses we can understand in terms of the, the, the QCD gauge coupling at high scales and the Yukawa coupling at high scales, and we can run everything down, flow from the UV theory to the IR theory, and we can calculate in terms of those microscopic parameters precisely where the pion mass comes from. We can put it on the lattice and we can calculate it and we see what it is. We're in the same situation with the Higgs. We could say, well, look, I don't care about quantum gravity. I don't care about you know, the land I pull for, for, for hypercharge. I don't care about dark matter or anything else. I have measured the Higgs mass. I'm going to set a counter term to cancel all of the quadratic corrections. I'm going to assume that I can never calculate it or derive it from some high scale. I'll just set a counter term, wash my hands of it and say that I'm happy. Um, let's go and, do some, uh, go and do something else. Of course, that would be essentially giving up on, on, on the scientific hope of understanding where the weak scale comes from, where, where the, the Higgs sector of the standard model comes from. So I think this is very, very radical. It's, in my opinion, it's, very, it's so radical that it's essentially throwing a major scientific question out the window because you don't want to talk about it. Um, but nonetheless, it, you could do that. You can just... You could just say, well, maybe this is all of nature and, and, and there is no microscopic origin for this parameter. We just have to measure it and, uh, and that's the only, the only uh, uh, understanding we'll have. Okay, so now to some more, more con concrete uh, ideas. Okay, so one of the, the main ones, and I think the one that's most useful and illustrative, and sadly for, for you guys means I will keep going on about pion physics, is um, uh, the notion that the, the Higgs could really be a pion, could really be a pseudo-Goldstone boson, and I'm going to make a, a little, make that, the notion of pseudo-Goldstone bosons a little bit more concrete in a second. Um, and this is an idea that's been around for a long time. It's actually, I think, you know, was first studied uh, sometime in the 80s. But it became uh, very, very popular um, about a decade ago. Um, and it's really an alternative to supersymmetry. I'm sure you've all heard of supersymmetry. But this isn't something that's as well known, I think, to the general public. But it's a totally reasonable uh, possibility. And, um, and I think it's worth explaining. And the other reason I think it's worth going into it is that there are some useful uh, tools involving group theory and continuous symmetries that, uh, that are useful in other areas of physics as well. So what's the idea? So, so, so what, is a what is a pseudo Goldstone boson? Um, so when you break a continuous global symmetry, I'll call the, the, the symmetry group G. So this could be something like, for the pions, it was SU2 left cross SU2 right. It could be SU3, SO10, whatever you want. It's just some continuous global symmetry. Um, 
if it is spontaneously broken to some uh, subgroup H, so for example, if this was SU3, this could be SU2. It's just some subgroup of the original continuous symmetry group. Um, then we have broken and unbroken generators. So essentially, uh, G is broken to H. So for each, um, uh, the, 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 the sort of the manifold of this continu continuous symmetry will be described locally by, by group generators by moving around uh, on group generators. So for SU3, there would be eight, and SU2, there would be three, and so on. And there are unbroken generators, which uh, describe essentially the, the, the group uh, that, is, that is unbroken. So this is still, we say this is unbroken. More specifically, you would say that it's linearly realized. And then there, there are the set of generators that we, we denote by the coset, which is G divided by H, G mod H in some sense, where this is now not you know, just two numbers, this is a, a group theory notion. But these are all the broken generators. Um, more specifically, the language I prefer is, uh, is uh, um, non-linearly realized. The reason I, I prefer linearly realized versus non-linearly non realized is that the, the notion of breaking the group spontaneously, the word bro breaking or broken, it's actually a bit misleading. The symmetry, all of the symmetry is there the entire time. Um, it never went away. But what has happened is that um, where we see the symmetry acting in the normal way for this guy here, which would be, so for example, if it were U1 symmetry, you take some, some element that transforms under that U1 and you ro rotate it by a phase, you multiply it by e to the i theta. That's the normal way we see um, the symmetry being uh, uh, respected. Here, the way you see this, the, sorry, the symmetry being, uh, 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 the, the way the symmetry acts on, on the representations. He, the, here, the way you see it is actually much more subtle. And the way it arises is essentially as a shift symmetry of a massless uh, boson. And we call that uh, uh, boson a, a NGB, Nambu Goldstone boson. So it was the, those guys who showed uh, a long, long time ago that for this story, for every uh, spontaneously broken continuous symmetry, the broken generators will all uh, um, be accompanied by an exactly massless uh, scalar field. And this is a general non-perturbative proof. Of course, if you have, why, why is there a P? If this symmetry is actually a little bit explicitly broken, just like with the pions, the quark masses broke the, the symmetry a little bit explicitly, then um, you may have the, re the remaining symmetry, un the unbroken symmetry. Here, um, but now these what would be massless Goldstone bosons actually become uh, massive Goldstone bosons because it was never a full symmetry anyway. But that mass can be small if the breaking of the symmetry is a small parameter, just like we saw with the pions. Um, okay, so is that is that relatively clear? I, I'm, I appreciate that some people will not be familiar with group theory, so I'm not going to try and avoid doing too much of it. But um, are there any questions at this point? Nope. Excellent. Okay, so how could this work for the Higgs? Um, so could this work for the Higgs? The, the, the answer is yep, pretty much, um, but with some details. So there's a, a, a simple recipe. And actually, there were many, there was a period where uh, uh, there were many, many uh, papers written demonstrating various uh, ways you could realize this re recipe, but the underlying physics is essentially always the same. So the number, you can count the number of guys here and the number of guys here. And you see that the number of gold stones is equal to the dimension of the unbroken group minus the dimension, sorry, the dimension of the, the, the initial group minus the dimension of the unbroken group. 
So that's just the dimension of this. So the number of, of broken generators um, is given by this formula here. However, we can also add some extra, um, um, an extra ingredient, which is that we could gauge some sub subgroups of uh, these symmetries. So what happens when, when we gauge this story? We start with a, instead of a global symmetry, we start with a gauge symmetry or gauge redundancy. I will say symmetry just because the language um, uh, um, trans translates nicely in between gauge and global for this story. So I will use gauge and global rather than gauge redundancy, but uh, you should keep in mind that they're really very different things. Um, so imagine we gauge this symmetry and it's spontaneously broken to this gauge symmetry then we, would, we no longer, uh, because of the Higgs mechanism, we no longer get this number of, of Goldstone bosons for the broken generators because each Goldstone boson um, is eaten by the gauge particle of, uh, of the spontaneously broken gauge symmetry. So in the standard model, we start with the, the, the Higgs doublet. Of, it has four scalars in it. But when we break SU2 across U1 to U1, um, we've spontaneously broken three generators. Um, and those, the, the gauge fields for those generators eat uh, three of those scalar degrees of freedom. So this is known as, as the Higgs mechanism. So had we, gauged, had we gauged this whole story, we would get zero Goldstone bosons in the spectrum. We would get no massless Goldstone bosons at all because they get eaten to become the longitudinal component of the, the gauge fields. So if I denote a gauged group with a tilde over the top, then if we gauged some aspects of the... the of, uh, of, uh, some, some, some subgroup of G and gauge some subgroup of H, then the number of total number of Goldstone bosons remaining would be uh, this guy here. Um, essentially because the Goldstones that would have come from here that correspond to a gauge symmetry actually get eaten to become longitudinal uh, components. Okay, so um, if we want to get the Higgs doublet, so the Higgs doublet I said had four, has four scalar fields living in it, in it. If we want to get the Higgs doublet out of this, then this guy here for our recipe has to be greater than or equal to four. We're going to accommodate the full, uh, the full uh, standard model Higgs doublet. So as I said, there are many papers written essentially furnishing a whole load of different possibilities for this. You can start with, it's basically a counting exercise. What group can I start with G uh, broken to H that, with maybe some subgroups of those uh, two groups gauged that will give me four or even a number close to four and I'll worry about the other details uh, later. Yep? Pardon? Yeah, so the, the tilde group is a, a, um, a gauged subgroup of, a, of G. So, so and equivalently for H's. So, for example, I could have an SU3 global symmetry. Um, and I will, we will do this actually. You can start with an SU3 global symmetry, so you can imagine this as the, the space of unitary 3 by 3 matrices, and it acts in the normal way on, say, a 3 plate. But I can then actually t gauge, I could have gauged a full SU3 symmetry as well, but I can also choose to gauge a subcomponent of that symmetry, where, for example, um, in here I have the, so I implicitly included the generators in here, but say in here I would have the generators of a full SU3 but I only give um, gauge fields to, say, the, the SU2 subgroup of that full SU3. Okay, okay. Um, so let's do an example. So if we break, for example, SU3 across U1x to... SU2 cross U1x. Then we know we have um, eight generators in here and one in here. And we have three generators in here and one in here. And eight minus three is five. So um, we get uh, five Goldstone bosons left over. 
5 is pretty close to 4. So, so why don't we just start with that? We've clearly got one extra Goldstone boson, but let's forget about it for a little while and work with this theory. So this is a, one, one of the first sort of explicit examples of a, of a PNGB Higgs model. And again, I'm not specifying anything about the UV completion, just like with the pions. I'm not saying, telling you what you know, strongly coupled gauge group is living in the UV and that has fermions that condenses and things like this. I'm not specifying any details like that, just from the group theory structure alone. Um, whatever does this spontaneous breaking will give you uh, five Goldstone bosons. Okay, so how do we understand the effective field theory of Goldstone bosons? Um, this is something that was worked out um, a long time ago by, uh, uh, it's typically referred to as CCWZ or CCWZ. And uh, um, uh, a number of papers also, various other people were, were, were involved, so it isn't just CCWZ, but that's, these are the clearest papers um, explaining this construction. And even though we don't know the UV completion, we can parameterize Write, easily write down, just based on symmetry structures alone, the effective field theory for Goldstone bosons. And the way this is typically done is that you would take um, some, some field that contains the, the Goldstone bosons to be expressed as um, the vacuum expectation value that breaks the symmetry. So for example, if I had something, if I was breaking SU3 and I had something that transformed in a threeplet, so let's see, say that sigma goes to um, a unitary matrix times sigma, that's the transformation, and this is a three by three matrix. Um, then if this, so this is a three by three vector, sorry, not three by three, this is a, a three dimensional vector. Then if I get a vacuum expectation value, for example, for, for the, the last component, I can actually up to up to the symmetry, choose any component or any mixture of components. But if I get a vacuum expectation value, then um, the symmetry will be broken just like the Higgs, you have the Higgs doublet, and the neutral component gets a vacuum expectation value and that spontaneously breaks SU2 symmetry. I can do the same thing here. So I have a three plot, and it gets a vacuum expectation value, um, which I will call sigma zero. So sigma zero would be you know, zero, zero F where F is the vacuum expectation value. So I could do this, for example, in a very uh, uh, Higgs-like manner. I could have some scalar field that's living in the three, and I, I could write down a Higgs-like scalar potential with a cortic like this, and, uh, and sorry, that should have had a minus sign, a cortic like this, and a mass squared, and if the mass squared is negative, like for the Higgs, you get a, um, a Mexican hat potential, you get a vacuum expectation value, and you'd spontaneously break the symmetry. Or it could be broken by some non-perturbative dynamics. There could be some strongly coupled gauge group in the UV, um, which leads to a quark condensate that has the same quantum numbers. It's still in a three-plit um, uh, that spontaneously breaks the symmetry. Either, either is fair game. But then we can parameterize um, the Goldstone bosons by um, uh, including this, this vacuum, writing sigma, the full sigma field, which here would have um, six scalar degrees of freedom. It's, there's three complex fields, so there's a real and imaginary field for each component here, so there's six degrees of freedom. But I know that I only have um, five Goldstone bosons. The other three scalar fields will be typically become heavy. There's nothing to keep them light because there's no symmetry. They aren't Goldstone bosons. So I can actually forget about those other three fields and just work with my Goldstone bosons. And then you can parameterize how they live in the sigma field by this construction where we write sigma is the vacuum expectation value multiplied by um, uh, uh, this exponential that contains the broken generators. So these are the generators of SU3 that have been broken. So these are all of the generators, and if you think of them in terms of three by three matrices, that when they act on the vacuum expectation value do not vanish. So for example, the generators living up in here you know, I've got the three generators of SU2, if I call this little corner SU2, and I act on this vacuum expectation value, you see that it vanishes. So those are the unbroken generators. All of the broken generators correspond to elements that live, that are non-zero along these pieces here. And there are five of them. 
and I can parameterize, I take those, those generators, and for each generator, I know there will be a, a mass of Goldstone boson. So I literally can track together a Goldstone boson for each generator. Um, and typically, these might be dimensionless, but uh, often people work in terms of a dimension full scalar fields, in which case you have the vacuum expectation value living in here. And then what you can do is to understand the physics of these Goldstone bosons, you write everything down in an SU3 symmetric manner. So you just use the usual, uh, the original symmetry. You work with this, uh, uh, this uh, threeplet, this fundamental representation of, of the SU3 symmetry, and you write down a theory that is completely SU3 symmetric in terms of, of this guy, this field here. And it turns out that this will capture all of the interactions. If you write down a general theory with all of the allowed terms, this will capture all of the possible interactions of the Goldstone bosons. Notice this, this parameterization of the fields may look a bit unfamiliar to you, but it's, it's really not that exotic. It's just like if you had a scalar field, a complex scalar field, you could write it as, um, as for example, you know, the real component plus I times the imaginary component. That's one way of writing it, but you could equivalently write it as, um, as the radial component. Again, this is a field, these are both fields. Um, and uh, uh, an angular component, if you wanted. You could parameterize it that there's two degrees of freedom here, there's two degrees of freedom here. It's purely a matter of choice. There's no physics contained in writing them in different ways. Um, it's just uh, how you may wish to parameterize it. And here, you could also find other more complicated ways of parameterizing all of, the, all of these Goldstone bosons, but it turns out that this is very slick and, and convenient. But it's not, not exotic, in, in really, in any way. Okay, so what happens for the Higgs? Let's actually do this construction. This, uh, it's called CCWZ. Let's do this construction for the Higgs. And uh, so we do this, and as I said, all of the broken generators live along here. Um, the extra one that we don't want corresponds to one of the diagonal generators. Um, just for the sake of simplicity now, I'm going to, to ignore it. This is a bit... Uh, this is illegal, but I'm, I'm going to do it nonetheless. Um, so we're just going to work with four, four generators. So we have four uh, scalar fields. We have four Goldstone bosons here. And the generators I'm interested in are the ones that correspond to these entries here. And when you do that, we can write that, that pi A, uh, uh, summing over the A's, of course, is written as uh, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then we have Higgs 1, Higgs 2. Higgs 1 dagger, Higgs 2 dagger, 0, where these guys are complex. So we have um, a complex scalar field here and a complex scalar field here, and they're, they're Hermitian conjugates. So what this means is we have four degrees of freedom, and you can see this is already making up the Higgs doublet. The Higgs doublet, the standard model Higgs doublet, will just be Higgs 1, Higgs 2. So when we do this, um, this big sigma field that we can use to, to write down all of the interactions, we just respect the, the SU3 symmetry and write down everything we're allowed to do. Um, in terms of the, 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 the big sigma field, it looks like this. This is going to be a bit of a mess. Um, where, where mod h is just equal to the, the magnitude of uh, the Higgs doublet. Okay, so, um, so this, this describes our sigma field. We can, we can now uh, parameterize all of its interactions. So for example, you could write down the kinetic terms. Um, for a global symmetry, they would look like this. This is just a standard kinetic term for, these, uh, 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 for this scalar field. 
sorry, there should be, dimensionally, there should be an F squared out the front. Oh, no, no, sorry. That's OK. Um, so these are the kinetic terms of the scalar field. Um, if you want to, to, to uh, if you don't trust me and you want to explore this, you can explicitly put this in. So explicitly put uh, this sigma field, which is expressed here, put in the derivatives and see what happens. And what you'll see is that you get uh, standard kinetic terms for the Higgs field plus some, some uh, higher order interactions involving, for example, four Higgs fields and two derivatives, uh, six Higgs fields and two derivatives, and so on. We can also choose this, this procedure I mentioned here of gauging a subgroup, this G tilde guy here. We can choose to gauge a subgroup um, of the, the global symmetry. And what we do is very, very simple. This is a three-plit. We can see that this is SU3 invariant. So then what we do is we just promote some part of that SU3 gauge symmetry to SU3 global symmetry to a gauge symmetry, where now we do exactly what you would expect. Um, you just promote the, the derivatives to the gauge covariant derivatives. Something like that. Um, if we had spontaneously broken, if the, uh, an if the whole thing was a gauge symmetry, then all of these Goldstone bosons would have been e eaten. So this would actually give you just the normal uh, 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 gauge boson mass terms plus the, the, the kinetic mixing terms between the Goldstone boson and the gauge fields. Um, but what we're going to want to do is gauge some subgroup because we know that the, SU t that the, the Higgs doublet, Higgs 1, Higgs 2 here, um, transforms under SU2 left cross U1 uh, hypercharge. Yep. Yep. Um, so, so if you put this guy, so that the sum over these guys enters here. And if you put um, this guy in here, then that's what you get. So it's uh, do the, the, the matrix exponentiation. Uh, usual way. Mathematica can do this for you now. <laughs> if you just put this in in Mathematica, this is what you get, I think, which is uh, pretty neat. But you should, of course, do it by hand yourself. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, yeah, so, so, so we know that the, the, the Higgs doublet transforms under SU2 left cross U1 hypercharge, which means that these gauge uh, um, derivatives now would just be the usual standard model ones. So d mu is d mu plus i g, you know, the sum over all of the gauge fields. Actually, I wrote it down over there, so I don't need to write it again. OK, so now we have gotten pretty far. There's a little bit of quasi-formal stuff, not much, though. Um, but what we have now is we have um, a, a Goldstone boson Higgs, so we can understand why it's light, and it has the observed gauge interactions. However, um, <clears throat> gauging a subgroup of a global symmetry breaks the global symmetry. I can see that because now, actually I should write this down. What did I write down over there? What's my notation? It's a D I G W mu Um, so this is the, the gauge covariant derivative. Now these guys are living in um, the generators for this guy and this guy all live in this space here. So I have, you know, the Z plus B and Z minus B, as Z plus A and Z minus A and things like this. Living in here, sorry, W zero, let's write it like that. This is all schematic here. I'm not putting in the actual uh, specific coefficients. But here, I have not gauged anything. So this gauge covariant derivative, as it acts on this three-plit, um, is like this. Now, let's perform an, a global S. Yep. Yeah, so, so you gauge some. Um, you have an, an additional U1 symmetry that this, this is a good question, that this uh, sigma transforms under. So in terms of, of uh, uh, group theory, this would be like having a U3 rather than SU3, so there's some extra bit, but it has a different, a different uh, gauge coupling that lives along the diagonal as well. Uh, very good question. <laughs> 
Okay, so now let's perf if I perform an SU3 global symmetry transformation corresponding to the generators that lived, um, uh, the corresponding to the broken generators, the one that lived along here, um, you can see they'll get all mixed up and tied up um, when I act on sigma. They'll get mixed up and tied up with the gauge fields here. So it turns out you can just do this exercise yourselves. You can see that actually the fact that I've gauged a subgroup of the full uh, uh, global group um, explicitly breaks uh, uh, the global symmetry. So now I have an explicit breaking of the global symmetry, and it's just like with the pions. If you remember that QED uh, interacted with the, the charged pions, but not the neutral pion, and that has explicitly broken uh, uh, the global symmetry that was keeping them all the same, which was like an SO3 symmetry. So just like with the pions, we expect a correction to the, to the Higgs mass. I'll go back over here. We expect a correction to the Higgs mass. Um, which looks like, for this class of models, um, which would look exactly like the pion mass correction, so delta m Higgs squared, has to scale something like g squared over 16 pi squared, uh, lambda squared, where lambda is whatever the scale of the, the cutoff is, where the, 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 sorry, the UV, not the cutoff, the UV completion is. Okay, so what this is telling us is that even if the Higgs is a pseudo-Goldstone boson, that if it's going to be light and avoid getting very large corrections from this, uh, from, from whatever the UV completion is, as I said, it may be some perturbative story where you just have some scalar field that gets a vacuum expectation value, or it could be some non-perturbative thing involving a strongly coupled gauge group in the UV. It doesn't matter. Um, there should be new physics the cutoff physics shouldn't be too far away if these corrections aren't going to get much larger than the weak scale. Um, and in fact, when we put in the, the, the known gauge couplings, this would probably not be more than, say, uh, a TV or a couple of TV. Um, there are ways to get around this. You can make this prefactor even smaller. This is known, one class of models is known as little Higgs models, where you, um, what you do is you enhance the group theory structure further. You would say, uh, for little Higgs models, you do two copies of this. You do two SU3s um, that are broken, spontaneously broken to two SU2s. But what you do is you only gauge group the SU2 subgroup of one of those SU3s. And then it turns, it turns out that this correction is delayed to higher loop orders. It would only come in at two loops, so it's smaller and so on. So the price you pay, you, you add extra baggage, which is more group theory technology, which means more fields. Um, but you can suppress these corrections. But at the first naive pass, uh, these corrections will always be there. Yep. Right, no, very good question. So yes, so if the Higgs was a PNGB, um, it's not from this correction alone, it's not guaranteed that you would expect to see it because this may only relate to the electroweak sector. And the LHC is actually has a lot of blind spots for purely electroweak charged stuff. You can get away with electroweak charged particles that are actually still at you know, uh, 200 GeV or something like that. Yep. Uh, good, very good question. No, so, so um, no, that wouldn't change because still, uh, in fact, ignoring it made it a little bit, actually makes it a little bit worse because what I did was just throw away a bit of the global symmetry. So I broke the global symmetry by ignoring it. In practice, if you do this example, um, you uh, don't throw that goldstone away. But he doesn't help with this because um, it was the gauging of the subgroup that actually broke the symmetry. And that's the reason. If I hadn't gauged the subgroup, then I would have a full global symmetry. It wouldn't have been broken in this correction. wouldn't have been there. But that additional scalar or the, these additional goldstones that can come along for the ride can be useful for other things. So for example, there are models where they have an extra Z2 symmetry which stabilizes them and they could be a dark matter candidate or they could um, uh, play other roles in, for example, modifying how the electroweak phase transition occurs, things like this. So they're not useless. In fact, um, this model, this SU3 model, this is in, in the, the homework, um, gives rise, it's not something that is, is seriously studied or and wasn't seriously studied. Um, it's a very good example, but the reason it's not seriously studied is that 
Um, if I use the SU3 symmetry alone, there's nothing to forbid me writing an operator that looks like um, conjugate that bit? I don't think so. So there's nothing to, uh, yeah, it's just like that, to forbid me writing an operator like this. And one of the problem sets in the homework is to explicitly um, put in the Higgs doublet. So in terms of the, the Higgs doublet, as I wrote it there, you can see that if I forget the sines and the cosines, if I take the small h limit, then uh, this looks like just Higgs dagger d mu Higgs squared. And you have the form of d mu. This is in the standard, uh, standard model textbooks, QFT textbooks. And you can put this in, and you see that this operator, it's a, known as a higher dimension operator. Um, but as I said, uh, if we're following this prescription, we don't know what the, the UV completion is. We have to write down all of the operators that are allowed by the symmetries. Um, and we uh, typically expect them to be there, unless there's some extra symmetry reason why they shouldn't be. And it turns out that this operator would be there and actually gives a large correction to this difference in mass between the W and the Z mass. And this is something that was very well constrained by the large electron-positron collider by LEP um, at CERN. And uh, so actually this class of theories is, is pretty much ruled out unless you do a lot of extra work to try and get rid of this. But it turns out there is a symmetry why, that could uh, forbid this operator. It's known as custodial symmetry. And other classes of models have that symmetry. So for example, if you, have, um, if you played a similar game but you did S05 to S04 and things like this, um, uh, then you have custodial symmetry and that forbids this operator which makes those models more attractive. Um, okay, but that's, that's one of the, in one of the problem sets. You literally just, what you have to do is literally just plug in the Higgs doublet, uh, the VEV of the Higgs doublet. So the, the VEV of the Higgs doublet is you know, zero V, and put in the gauge covariant derivatives and see what happens to the W and Z mass. Yes. Yes. Uh, ah, no, ex exactly. So, so what have we gained with respect to um, what we already thought would happen for the Higgs in the first place, even if it wasn't a, a, a Goldstone boson. Um, we'll get to that for the, the, the tops. Let me get to the tops and you'll see. So let's do the tops. But yes, absolutely. So, so exactly, I mean, that's, that's sort of the message, is that if you try to make the Higgs be like a pion for the gauge interactions, you, stu you still don't get, uh, get, out, get very far. But when I get on to another class of theories called the twin Higgs, you'll see that you, you do. Um, so this is the, the first pass. This is like the first pass of our plane, and now we, we loop around and come back again. Um, okay, so what about the top quarks? So um, as was just pointed out, you know, the first thing we wrote down this morning was that for the top quarks, you expect to get corrections that go like the Yukawa squared times uh, uh, um, the cutoff squared. So what happens for a PNGB Higgs? So how do we write uh, the, the top interactions? So we embed, everything has to be now SU3 symmetric. So we embed um, the top quark doublet into a top quark triplet. So we have, for example, the, the left-handed doublet would go like top left, bottom left. And now we have to make it a full triplet. So we, there's an extra field um, to fill out the full triplet. We'll call it big T. And then you can write down an SU3 invariant um, interaction. U dot sigma uh, times T right. And you see here that this is completely SU3 invariant. So this respects the global symmetry. So if it respects the global symmetry, it cannot give rise to a mass for the Goldstone boson because the Goldstone boson is, is protected uh, by the SU3 symmetry. SU3 symmetry hasn't been broken. So fantastic. So we now have the, the top quark Yukawa, um, and we have not generated this term. But we have a great big problem, which is that you see when the Higgs gets a VEV, I will marry up the top right with, for example, the, the top. But then I'll have not just the bottom left hanging around, uh, 
but also this guy here, massless. So this, this predicts a, a new, extremely light um, colored fermion, which we haven't seen. It doesn't exist. So, uh, so there's a problem. So this can't work. Now, one thing you could do is explicitly um, just do something sloppy, like when we gauge the subgroup here, uh, do something sloppy and just literally delete this from the theory. So pretend, you know, bury your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. Set this guy to zero. And then we still have the top core Kyukawa. But again, um, the, then we've explicitly broken the symmetry by setting it to zero. And we expect to get exactly the same correction that we saw earlier, which goes something like three lambda top squared. Um, lambda squared, where lambda is the scale of the UV completion, uh, times 16 pi squared. So we haven't then, we've still not gained anything. We've seen that if we try uh, to construct a theory where the, the, the Higgs is a Goldstone boson, um, but has just the standard model field content and the standard model interactions, that despite all of our extra work, we've gained absolutely nothing relative to what you would naively expect. The last uh, escape route is to keep this extra guy in the theory, big T. And then we can introduce some explicit breaking of the symmetry. So, so we write down an interaction that is not SU3 invariant, but does give a mass to big T. Um, that looks like this, where we've added in, added in by hand an extra fermion, um, which has the, uh, 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 the, quant the con complex the conjugate quantum numbers of, of big T. So we write this down and um, we can now anticipate what will happen. So if we are at low energies, then this theory looks very not SU3 symmetric. But say we went to very, very high energies, way, way above the mass of, of MT. At very, very high energies, this operator is not, not very relevant for, for the physics. MT is a small number. Say, we're, say MT was 500 GeV and we're working at 5 TV or something like this. Um, so the, the only relevant interactions up at those scales are, are the Yukawas, and they look SU3 symmetric. So in this theory, in the, the UV, we have an SU3 symmetry, which has been, we say, softly broken by um, a, a, a mass parameter for, for the tops. And it turns out that you can actually just go ahead and, so what this means is that then we expect to get corrections like this, but the only term we have, again, let's use the Spurion argument, the only term we have in the theory that's breaking the SU3 symmetry is this term MT. Using the symmetry arguments that I, I outlined yesterday. So we would expect that the corrections to the Higgs mass squared must scale like something like um, three lambda top squared. Three just comes from the fact that there's, it's QCD, so there's three guys in here. Lambda top squared over 16 pi squared. There's only one spurion that's breaking the symmetry, which is this MT guy. So that should go like MT squared. And in fact, you can actually just go ahead and calculate in this theory. You calculate the, the top loops with Higgses. And you get also from, from this interaction from the cosine. You notice the cosine bit at the end. So the big T is living in the third component. And the cosine is living in the third component. So you get big T and then a cosine from here. Cosine looks like, when you expand it out, it looks like one plus Higgs squared. So you get an interaction that looks like Higgs squared big, big T squared, um, or Higgs squared big T T right. When you integrate it out, uh, you get something like this. This, if, you, if anyone's interested, this could have been an exercise for the problems. I took it out, but if anyone's interested, you can do this explicit calculation. And uh, this is exactly the answer you get. Pardon? I can't, sorry. You, uh, well, I could, yeah, I can, I mean, it's just a matter of nomenclature, or call it QC. Yeah, I could call, call this guy TC or whatever. Yeah. Um, okay, so what does this tell us? So this tells us that you can get away with having actually large um, uh, top Yukawa for a PNGB Higgs. But the price you pay is that there must be a um, new colored fermion living somewhere uh, around. And the heavier you make him, the, more, the, the bigger the corrections to the Higgs mass become. And if this guy is heavier than, say, four or 500 GeV, these corrections start to become 
uh, bigger than the, the mass of the Higgs itself. So there's, you start to have to, to fine tune the theory. Essentially, you're getting big quantum corrections, so you need to add in a bare uh, source of explicit breaking that would give mass to the Higgs, which exactly cancels this to leave a, leave a light Higgs boson. So the price you're paying for, for uh, winning uh, uh, PNGB Higgs is that there have, has to be new degrees of freedom, new things you can search for at the LHC. And in this case, they're colored, um, uh, colored new fermions, which, which stick out like a sore thumb. You should be able to see them. OK. Um, again, all of this is, you know, follows the naive, ex the, 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 the naive expectations that I, that I outlined from uh, those sort of basic uh, uh, EFT tools. So now I want to discuss a class of theories which has been studied more recently, but is definitely not textbook material. As I said, for textbook material, you can look at textbooks. Um, but this is a class of theories that became very popular about um, four years ago. It was actually written down about 12 years ago, I think now, um, and it's known as the Twin Higgs. And it uses some of these tools, but in a sort of a curious way, um, not to avoid, as you can see f from these arguments, it's pretty inevitable. Sorry, yep. Right, so yes, you also have to have the, the bottom quark Yukawa. An epsilon in here. Uh, uh, B right. So you have to explain all of the observed particle masses. So you do have to have a bottom Yukawa, but you can't escape the top Yukawa. I'm not adding it to, to uh, as a model building tool. I'm adding it because it exists in nature. Ah, okay. Well, this is so, so the bottom's living in here. So the, you start with the standard model doublet. So, yeah, I'm calling this T, but that's just a name. I could call him X, for example. It's not really that he's a top. He actually has uh, uh, a different um, hypercharge and things like this. Very good. Yes, MT turns out to be, uh, oh, sorry, not MT, the, you get a mass, um, oh no, sorry, so, so, so you're saying you would expect it to show up here? It, so it does at some point, but it's sort of subleading, so, um, let me, so, so MT, so this, so MT is the only parameter that broke this, this symmetry. So this can only be MT. But that, that does show up in the calculation. So you, you've spotted something, something uh, non-trivial here, which is that when I expand out the cosine bit living in here, I have something like um, lambda top um, h squared over f coupled to uh, t and then uh, uh, t right. So that's the actual interaction. But then you diagonalize to the mass basis because also um, you've given a, a, a coupling of order of size f to the, the, that mixes t and t right. So you diagonalize to the mass basis. And then when you have diagonalized to the mass basics, basis and you um, calculate this loop, there's actually an f which cancels in the, the numerator in here, cancels that f squared in here. Uh, things like, you know, mt to the 4 over f squared. Yeah, absolutely. So they won't go, it won't go exactly like this because, um, well, maybe it will with another h bar, so at, at higher loops it could. So, so, uh, so this is a very good question. So in general, you could have something like this. It won't go exactly like this because you see this has to have dimension of, of mass, if it's one loop, of mass squared. And remember I pointed out yesterday that f, f has dimensions of field which actually has dimensions of um, uh, uh, mass divided by coupling. Basically, yes. 
exactly that way. Which is why that I sh wanted to show you that HBAR stuff. Because you could, if you just do normal dive, naive dimensional analysis, you don't know. But I, you can already see that there has to be an extra coupling squared in here, or an H bar, so it's higher loop. So it lets you count very quickly, see where all of the loops and couplings uh, have to come in. But absolutely. OK. Um, so this, this class of models is known as the, the Twin Higgs. It was unpopular because pre-LHC, there were uh, essentially uh, much more attractive looking models on the market. And this Twin Higgs model was sort of seen as a sort of an academic curiosity but not something to be taken too seriously. Yep. Uh, this, this guy here. Yeah, so that's this guy here, so Higgs squared. So if you look at the, I've got the third component in here, uh, contracted onto the third component of sigma, and the third component of sigma is F, cosine of, of mod h over f. Cosine is 1 plus h squared. Cosine of h is 1 plus h squared over f squared. And h squared is just this guy here, squared. So that's where it comes from. Yep. Yes. Right, but we did that already. That's what I did before the tops. So, so how do you speak about these? Uh, so, if there is a lambda, then what is the importance of the two? Yeah, so, you have actually two terms additive. Right, okay, so, so yeah, so that was the term we just did, which was the, uh, this guy here, delta m squared goes like g squared lambda squared. But the point is that if mt is small, the correction for the top mass from the top Yukawa is small. So, and also, so the, and the top Yukawa is the biggest coupling in the, the game, so that's what you want to worry about the most. If I do this naive thing, the top Yukawa is going to give me the biggest corrections. The gauge are always there, but they're not too bad. If the UV completion is living around a few TV, you're not in too much trouble, but the top would, would kill you. This trick lets you take the cutoff uh, by introducing some small explicit breaking, take the cutoff uh, uh, a way up, so then you would maybe saturate, saturate the, the gauge corrections but at the price of having to introduce new degrees of freedom. And in fact, even for the gauge, you can play tricks using this twin Higgs stuff to, to uh, sorry, this uh, uh, little Higgs stuff to make these gauge, as I, I mentioned, the gauge corrections smaller, but the price there is that you always pay, um, for pay the price of the requirement of additional degrees of freedom. Every time you try to, to break this naive thing, this naive expectation, you, when you achieve it, you always find that you've got new degrees of freedom that are soaking up some, some uh, uh, symmetries. Okay, so, so let's, we've, uh, just over 10 minutes. So I want to talk about this. So I'm only going to do 10 minutes in this because it's, um, it's not textbook material and uh, it's not something that everyone works on, but I think it's useful because it's something that people are working on at the minute or at least have been in, in recent years and it illustrates some uh, uh, how you, how you can evade some of these naive expectations, particularly the, that we've got new um, colored particles, um, in sort of a cute way, but again, you'll see there's always a price to pay. So the idea of the twin Higgs, this is by uh, uh, Chaco and Harnick and Go, um, is that you have a standard model, just the normal standard model that we know and love, and then you add a complete copy called the twin standard model. And this is really, uh, for our purposes today, it will be an exact copy. So there will be top quarks and the Higgs and a photon and everything in here, but it's not the same top quarks and Higgs and photon as in here. It's an exact copy. So these guys are not charged under our, our, own, our own QED. They're charged under their own QED. So our particles, our electrons, do not scatter off those electrons via the photon, our photon. They, 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 they have their own photons. So at this level, it's a completely decoupled sector. You wouldn't know it exists except for maybe cosmologically. And then um, the only interactions consistent with the gauge symmetries are not the only, but the most important interactions consistent with the gauge symmetries are called uh, this, the twin Higgs. So this is the Higgs from the twin sector. Um, 
are, for example, uh, we can have a mass term and then a quartic interaction. And what we will impose on the theory is an exchange symmetry. So this is a symmetry, um, we call it a Z2 symmetry, um, where we literally lift every particle in here and we swap it with every particle in here. So we go, do that. And if all of the gauge couplings and Yukawa couplings are identical on both sides, then that will leave the theory unchanged because I've taken a photon with a, you know, the uh, a coupling of E to the electrons and I've entirely transplanted this guy. But if this guy also had a, photon, a twin photon with the twin electron with exactly the same uh, gauge coupling, then the theory the Lagrangian that you had um, looks exactly the same. So we impose an exchange symmetry. And we can see that this then means that if, the, if you respect the exchange symmetry, then the mass squared for the Higgs and the twin Higgs looks exactly the same. So I can write it like this. This term here break, uh, uh, respects that exchange symmetry. And there's also a term that I want you to ignore for a little while. I'll call it lambda tilde, which also ex respects the exchange symmetry, uh, which looks like this. Um, <clears throat> so what we see here is that we have, um, if we ignore this term, for the, for the moment, pretend it doesn't exist. Um, if we have a theory that spits out this, uh, this action at some UV scale, say, you know, 3 TV or something like this, then we see we have the exchange symmetry has enforced um, at the quadratic level that we actually have an, uh, an enhanced symmetry in t as far as the masses are concerned, which is that we can write, let's call uh, H tilde as H and then H twin. So this is a doublet, and this is a doublet, so this is a fourplet. There are four uh, complex scalar fields in here. And we can see that this actually has a symmetry where I could write this whole uh, potential as minus m squared Higgs tilde squared. Sorry, that should be minus. Minus lambda over two Higgs tilde to the four. And we see that because this is a fourplet, this actually has an accidental SU4 symmetry because it's a fourplet, and I've written it in an SU4 symmetric manner. Again, we're forgetting about this guy. So now, imagine that big Higgs tilde gets a VEV. So I'm just, for the sake of uh, 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 not confusing you, remember this is two doublets. So if this gets a VEV, for example, in the fourth component, we'll call it F, then this breaks SU4 to SU3. This means that we get the number of gold stones we get is equal to 15, that's the number of generators in SU4, minus 8, which is the number of generators in SU3, which is equal to 7. So we get 7 goldstone bosons. But we have full, this is a twin standard model, and this is the standard model. So we actually have gauged, this guy here is a standard model Higgs doublet, so he is actually charged under the standard model gauge interactions under this SU2 gauge group. And this guy here is charged under the twin, sta the twin standard model gauge in interactions, so this is the twin SU2 gauge group. So we've actually gauged an SU2 subcomponent um, of this SU4. So when this guy gets a VEV, this doublet gets a VEV, you see here, then just like for the Higgs in the standard model, this, this VEV spontaneously breaks the twin SU2 left cross twin U1 hypercharge, and three, the twin gauge bosons become massive. So that formula I wrote down before with the G tildes and the H tildes for gauge subgroups apply. So we actually have three of those gold stones have become eaten to become the longitudinal components of the twin gauge bosons. So now we have minus three, which is equal to four, and Bob's your uncle, we have exactly we, what we need for these four guys here to be uh, pseudo gold stone bosons. So this is again a, a, a PNGB Higgs type um, approach. Okay, so that's great. Um, but as we saw before, um, we've now done things like gauged subgroups. Uh, so we expect to get corrections in this story, corrections to the, to the scalar masses that look like G squared times the cutoff squared. So let's calculate what they are. <clears throat> 
So we know already from the standard model sector that the correction to the Higgs mass will look like, so let's say uh, delta V at one loop, we expect it to go like G squared over 16 pi squared uh, lambda squared Higgs squared. So we expect to be in trouble, but of course there's also the one loop corrections from the cutoff that go like G twin squared over 16 pi squared lambda twin squared Higgs twin squared. And this is where you start to see a little bit of, of the magic of the twin Higgs. And this is really, the, the, I think, the reason that these guys uh, wrote the paper. So we have two different mass corrections from the gauge sector that we've seen now, I don't know, 20 times uh, 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 for scalars. We don't know what's going on at the cutoff, but we expect these corrections to be there. And they look like this and like this. And so in principle, they look different. But we have an exchange symmetry. So if this exchange symmetry is respected, G twin is exactly the same as G. So I can just write this. Um, lambda twin, if, if the, even the UV physics respects exchange symmetry, lambda twin is just equal to lambda. So I can simply write this as G squared over 16 pi squared, lambda squared, Higgs squared plus Higgs twin squared, which I can write as G squared over 16 pi squared, lambda squared, Higgs tilde squared. So this is now the fourplet. And you see that these unknown corrections from the UV will actually respect the uh, SU4 symmetry that you started off with. So they will not generate a mass for the Higgs, for the Goldstone, because they respect the, uh, the initial symmetry in the first place. And this is all because of the, the exchange symmetry that sets this bit equal to this bit. Which tells you then that at one loop, you will not have a quadratic sensitivity to the, to the cutoff from the gauge loops. Um, and in fact, there will be gauge partners, which are the, turn out to be the gauge bosons, the, the, the W and Z bosons of the twin sector, actually cancel the quadratic sensitivity coming from the standard model gauge bosons. And you get this term here um, that you naively expect gets eliminated at one loop. What about the tops? The, the story for the tops is similar. So this is, uh, that was the, the gauge, and now we add in the Yukawas. And we have exactly the same thing, lambda top squared over 16 pi squared, uh, lambda squared, Higgs squared, blah, 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 blah. And you see, again, because of the exchange symmetry, this looks like lambda top squared over 16 pi squared, lambda squared, Higgs squared, plus Higgs top squared. If you want, you can also, you can just go and calculate these things um, diagra diagrammatically, put in all of these ma the matter content, go to the, the diagonal mass base, ma basis and, and, and integrate things out. Um, but this is the answer you will get. And you see that again, it respects the SU, the top corrections respect the SU4 symmetry. So at one loop, there are no, there's no quadratic sensitivity of the cutoff to, uh, for coming from uh, the, the fermionic couplings. But what's really peculiar here is that we've, we haven't added uh, electroweak charge fields and we haven't added a QCD charge field. So in the standard PNGB model, you saw that to, to add in the top Yukawa in an SU3 symmetric way, we had to add in something in this multiplet. But because it's in a multiplet, if we respect the SU3 symmetry, this guy had to be colored because these two guys were colored. What we've done here is pretty slick because what we've added is stuff that's completely uncolored. It's completely gauge neutral, impossible to see at the LHC. And um, we've eliminated these, these quadratic divergences. So this makes the twin Higgs a very interesting model. And this is, you can see now why in retrospect. Yep. Uh, they're both gauged. So they're both. Uh, Ah, because um, this VEV here, so there's an SU2 that acts on this guy part and an SU2 that acts on this guy here. So we've gauged them both. They're both identical. But this vacuum expectation value only breaks this SU2. Um, in other words, when I give uh, a VEV to this, that's the same as giving a VEV to this guy. So this guy only breaks the twin SU2. But this guy didn't get a VEV, so the standard model SU2 at this level remains unbroken. Um, so you can see in retrospect why this became popular after the first set of results of the LHC came out, because this is a class of theories where 
you can understand that the, the, at least the little hierarchy problem, the, the notion that there's a, uh, uh, some UV completion sitting around the corner, could actually be uh, not so severe um, because there's a symmetry, uh, a symmetry story under la uh, that gives an explanation why, why there aren't large corrections to the Higgs mass. But um, as I said, you always pay the price of additional degrees of freedom, additional particles you can search for. And that is always the case, and in this case, you have those particles, but it just so happens that they're completely gauge neutral. And um, because they're completely gauge neutral, um, they're very hard to see at the LHC. So they could be out there, but we haven't seen them yet. And in some cases, they're more easy to see uh, from cosmological observations, because if you truly have a twin copy here, then you also have twin neutrinos, twin photons, and they can be relevant cosmologically. Um, the only interaction that you can use at colliders um, comes through when I square this guy, I get a mixing term between the Higgs and this, the twin Higgs. So you get the scalar sector of the standard model gets modified. It looks like you have a new singlet living there. So it's very interesting phenomenologically. Um, and finally, um, there's a, a skeleton in the closet, which is the, all of this magic was happening because of the exchange symmetry. But this term, the exchange symmetry was enforcing at the quadratic level. Um, an accidental SU4 symmetry, just because I have two doublets that have the same mass terms. This term here respects the SU4 symmetry, and the, the SU4 symmetry is the reason that we have a Goldstone in the first, first place, but this term here does not. So if you uh, add in this term, which you would expect naively to be there, if you add in this term, then this whole story breaks down because you will get a mass for the Higgs that is pro correction for the Higgs that's proportional to lambda tilde times um, F squared, where F is the, the symmetry breaking scale in the twin sector. So there's an additional, I'm not going to go into it now, but there's an additional model building requirement is that your UV completion should, for some reason, um, spit out uh, this term being very small at the cutoff scale. It doesn't have to be zero, but you need it to be small. Yep. Um, no, so exactly. So, so, so these were the problems. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so, but the the exchange symmetries. That was that was the, that's the point of the model. So you have exactly these problems for both sectors. So that's exactly what you have. So you have this guy for our sector and this guy for that sector. But you see that if you have the exchange symmetry then these terms are identical to those terms, so they actually respect the SU4 symmetry. The SU4 symmetry has not been broken at the quadratic level, thanks to the exchange symmetry. If you didn't have the exchange symmetry, absolutely, you would have that, that problem. But furthermore, you, 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 so, so as I was saying, you need to have a theory that makes this small. Oh, yep. Pardon? Uh, no. So square this. You get Higgs to the four plus two, Higgs squared, Higgs top, Higgs t squared, plus, uh, plus Higgs t to the four, whereas this modifies the cross term between them. Yeah, yeah, but it's of a specific form. This is SU4 invariant, and this is not. Sorry. Very good. Um, no. And the reason is that, say I started at some high scale, so this is what I was about to say actually, say I started at some high scale, let's call it 4 TV, then and if at that scale this guy vanishes, then I have to go to lower energies and see what happens, so I RG evolve. And what happens is that I, I generate, even just from the standard model interactions and the twin standard model interactions, I generate terms, corrections of the cortic that look like... Um, uh, uh, lambda top um, to the four, must be, um, over 16 pi squared uh, Higgs to the four plus Higgs T to the four. And then there'll be a log of some, you know, let's call it M over F when I run down to the, to the F scale. Um, and you can see that this is not SU4 symmetric. I can absorb this into an SU4 symmetric term plus a non-zero lambda tilde.
um, which is telling that even if you get the magic to work, and there are models that can do it, even if you get the magic to work such that at the cutoff scale, uh, this guy vanishes and it looks SU4 symmetric, the RG evolution alone will break that SU4 symmetry. And as I said, if, if you have this term, it generates a mass for the, for the Higgs, a mass correction for the Higgs proportional to lambda tilde times F squared. So if you want that to not be too big, you need this term to be small. And the only re way you can get this term to be small is if the high scale is not too far away. If this log happens to be small, if this log were big, you'd be totally doomed. So that's one, uh, that's, that's, that, that's the main uh, thorn in the side of these models. So you, so you cannot push these particles, you cannot push F and these other particles arbitrarily heavy without paying a, a price. The second thing is that even at two loops, um, this cancellation does not, this, the, these guys do not look necessarily SU4, uh, oh no sorry, it does, it goes to arbitrarily high loop. It works at arbitrary high loops for this, for the quadratic piece but the quartic pieces are, are, are a problem. Yep, oh, so we'll go. Uh, don't the Yukawa interactions break the SU4 symmetry? Because like the standard model phase is a couple Yes, exactly. Like that, that is, that's precisely the problem. Oh. That's how it hits you. Ah, good question. So yes, so naively, yes, exactly. So if I did this, have I started with this? That you would actually, because of the exchange symmetry, you'd have equal VEV in the twin and the standard model sector. They would be uh, aligned equally in that. So what you need to do is you, just like for this guy, we added a little bit of SU3 breaking that we could get away with. You add a little bit of SU4 breaking, so a mass term that's not exchange symmetric. One way of doing it is to do that, which pushes all the VEV to be mostly in the, in the twin sector. Does that answer your question? Yep. Yep. Okay, so very good. Um, the second option is something that people do a lot. Uh, I really dislike it because um, the only reason this thing worked was that the physics at the cutoff, which you don't necessarily know what it is. I mean, you can you can write down supersymmetric models. You can write down the whole thing uh, that works all the way up to the Planck scale if you want. But but um, the physics at the cutoff, you don't know necessarily know what it is. Now imagine I take this twin standard model and literally just throw a bunch of particles in the trash can, say gone, then that's a very hard breaking of the symmetry. It doesn't show up in the, in the infrared, just through these effects, you don't see any problems. But what it means is that in the UV, you have a very, very hard breaking of that symmetry, so it's very, very dangerous. So I don't like that option, but people do it to, in some sense, just to study the phenomenology of the lightest, of the, of the most relevant particles. The alternative is to get rid of them in some way that's soft in the sense that it doesn't spoil the, the UV story. Um, so you can do that. For example, you could um, have additional fields that pair up with the, the neutrinos to give them a, a mass, the twin neutrinos to give them a mass that makes them not too dangerous. You could have a field in the twin sector um, that gets a small vacuum expectation value and breaks um, twin electromagnetism, so you have no light photon. So you can play games, but it, so you can make the, 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 the cosmology safe. Or an alternative is actually to keep all of this stuff and have, find a way to have the cosmology such that you maybe have a low reheating temperature so that you never really access uh, these interactions very efficiently and you only reheat into the standard model, which would mean that you only get standard model particles being hot and, and making up our universe. And there's a very small number density of these particles, which then helps you evade cosmological bounds. But this is a, a whole program of study that people you know, f try to find ways around, uh, around the cosmological issues. <laughs>
Yeah, no, no. So, so, so there can be kinetic mixing. If you can calculate it at some very high loop order, it would be there. But it could also uh, uh, be bigger. And that can actually be um, interesting cosmologically. People have written papers about that. But there's, it's not, it's not, um, it's sort of like with supersymmetry, right? So nature is not supersymmetric. And no one ever believed it was, I hope. Um, but we know that there, you can break supersymmetry in such a way that you preserve the night UV story um, at the price of modifying the IR story. So that's soft supersymmetry breaking. You add soft mass terms and so on. And the game is exactly the same here. You can preserve the nice UV story um, while still in the IR having breakings of the, the exchange symmetry that make it you know, phenomenologically and cosmologically um, acceptable. You may have an aesthetic, aesthetic preference about, um, you know, you may dislike that, and I think that's, that's totally fair. Uh, all I would say is that nature thus far doesn't really seem to care at all about our aesthetic preferences. So, uh, we, you know, we have to explore all possibilities. Finish there. Let's stay.